Hello and welcome to the No Fear Podcast. Today's guest is Ari David, founder of Upward News. Join us for an awesome conversation where we explore Ari's journey from software developer to editor-in-chief of his own media network. Along with that, we'll discuss Ari's philosophy about modern journalism and how Upward News aims to uproot the media establishment in the United States. Join us for an awesome episode and enjoy. Welcome to the No Fear Podcast with your hosts, Noah and Ophir, where we sit down to discuss the journeys of accomplished young professionals who have taken action towards manifesting a career and a life that go far beyond the ordinary. Each week, we bring to you a young professional currently achieving success in entrepreneurship, STEM or other forward-thinking, innovative sectors. Please enjoy today's episode of the No Fear Podcast, brought to you by House & Hughes, shophouseandhughes.com the perfect destination for thousands of curated wall art designs. Well, Ari, I'm glad things are going well. Uh, I know that the big move is probably changing your life up a little bit, but thanks for taking the time to be here with us today and talk a little bit about what you do. Yeah, it's about time. I think we've been planning on this for quite a while at this point. So um, I'm excited that I'm finally not anonymous and I can do this thing. Absolutely. I remember when we were first, you know, talking about finalizing the plans for it and we were coming to you for a little bit of advice. And at the time you were still anonymous. So I'm really excited that you're here. Me too. Me too. Thank you guys. Well, just to start us off, can you tell us what Upward News is, how you started it and uh, what the goal is right now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So to explain what it is, I'll just start off by how it got started. It's been about three years now since we created the Instagram, which is what it was originally. And we started it during the uh, Black Lives Matter summer of 2020. And at that point, I think it was like the most divisive that America has been in our lifetimes, for sure. I mean, people were out on the streets every single day. If you were on social media, you know, people were posting very extreme infographics, uh, usually from the left. People were posting these black squares. There was no real room for any kind of productive conversation. It was just, you're either reposting this stuff or uh, you're kind of excommunicated. I think the phrase that they were using at the time was uh, silence is hatred, essentially. So if you weren't saying anything, you know, they were already targeting you. And there was no productive conversation happening on social media. So what I decided to start doing is creating infographics about these topics that people were talking about. And it would include police brutality, all these crime statistics, just different perspectives of looking at the issues that people were talking about constantly. And needless to say, the way we wrote it was a way that wasn't attacking people. It was just giving people objective facts that they could look at and talk about. And because of that, it took off. A lot of the posts went viral. And... Since then, we've pivoted away from kind of reacting to what was going on and just trying to talk about the events that are going on today and provide more context and more intelligent analysis about them. So in essence, the goal of Upward News is to be able to deliver journalism that's quick. You know, nobody wants to read thousand words anymore. Uh, journalism that's smart. So not trying to make you angry, just trying to give you some level-headed analysis. Um, And journalism, that's complete. And by that, I mean, you shouldn't have to go down a rabbit hole of trying to figure out what's going on in the news uh, from one article. An article should really have enough context so that you feel like you know what's going on just from it. So those are like the three concrete points that we're trying to build out with Upward News. To give you a compliment, the before I had met you, a number of our friends, my brother as well, had shared a number of your posts. So it gained traction during this time, during this very divisive time. And how have you seen that growth be then versus now? Yeah, you know, I think, well, first of all, thank you for for the compliment. I think that America right now is in a completely different point that it was in during 2020. Like at that point, there were still people that were arguing whether socialism is better than capitalism. And you don't really hear about that on social media anymore. And by bringing up that point, I'm just trying to show that we've really pushed past this like foundational ideological argument that we were having at the time. And now we're kind of back into this, like uh, really more 
a loud kind of conversation and discussing like things like the debt ceiling. You know what I mean? Like we've really kind of shifted what we're talking about at this point. And in terms of growth, I mean, we were tapping into that at the time. We were growing really fast. We've also moved away from that style of content. And the goal now is not trying to just debunk everything, but just trying to give more uh, insights and uh, breaking down the news. In general, whenever there is more things going on, uh, whenever things are crazier, people want to see how their friends are reacting. That's why people go to social media at this time. That's when you really grow. Um, right now, people are kind of trying to get off of Instagram. People are trying to get off of Twitter, um, except for the, the little spikes that happen. But yeah, because of that, growth has been a lot slower. Uh, but it, it's also just a difference of the audience that we're getting too. You know, the people that we're growing with right now are people that are more tuned in on a regular basis versus before people that were just tuning in during these crazy times. No, I, I love to hear that the growth has been so strong and that everything has been a, a procedural process going from just an Instagram page to, to taking it further. And everything that you're doing seems very thought through. So I'm curious, how did you come up with the name Upward News? Yeah, so we've had three different names since we started. The first name that lasted about five months, it was called Freedom for Facts. And uh, <laughs> the purpose of the page really at that, that point was... Yeah, it was called Freedom for Facts. The icon was like the Statue of Liberty with an American flag. And the whole point of it was just to give out facts um, without anything, just the facts. And that's what took off initially. Then a couple months later, we renamed it to Unwoke Narrative. And that was much more of a spicy name. It was really a direct jab at people that prioritized ideology over like the reality and objective truth. And it was great. It was great until that term started being even more divisive. And when we were posting like these like posts that debunked the narrative, Unwoke Narrative was great. But as we ventured out and tried just covering regular stories that are happening in the nation and politics, we realized that the name isn't really fitting what we're trying to do anymore. Like not every post that we're trying to do is a jab at somebody. Um, it's more of a service that we see to keep people informed. And so at that point, I really wanted to keep Unwoke Narrative, the logo, which was UN. So I started thinking, what can I create that has the first two letters UN? And Upward News was just what I came by because it really consolidates the fact that we're trying to write better, smarter journalism. Um, it also you know, stands for itself. We can be anything with that name. It's not limiting. It's just kind of expansive in that way. Now, obviously, you guys have grown quite a large following on social media, a ton of subscribers as well. Can you break down the process of bringing news daily into circulation along with how your team is structured? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've actually, like this past week, I've been trying to do some research on how newsrooms operate and how like the real you know news happens. And there's actually not a lot of like transparency on this. Um, it's quite crazy. So for me, it's been really building out what worked for us. And I'll tell you, I mean, the night before, uh, we put out every newsletter around noon. So when it comes to the evening time and the news cycle is pretty much over, there's no new articles coming out. What I usually do is I'm still kind of the editor in chief. So I go through almost like dozens and dozens of different news outlets. I look at what stories that they covered that day. And the ones that catch my eye and kind of have me asking questions about it, like, that's kind of interesting what's going on there. Or this is kind of interesting because we're probably going to be talking about it in a week or something. So I'll start to put a list together of probably around 12 different stories that I think are the most important. Um, and one of the things we try to do is anything that is kind of like gossipy or anything that is like this person said that, that doesn't really impact your life. We kind of ignore all of it. Because the great thing about having a newsletter is that we don't need the virality that you need on like a social media platform. You're not trying to create something that's gossip that's going to explode. You're actually just trying to keep the people that are subscribed to your newsletter informed. When we have all of these articles, we then figure out which ones are we going to dive into, which are ones are we going to dive into a little bit, and which ones are we just going to link to. And uh, I have a couple of writers at this point, so they get assigned the article that they're going to write. Um, and I have a strong understanding of who understands which topic better. Uh, in journalism, they call it beats, like what beat are you on? And yeah, by morning time, we've got everything written. And then it goes to our copy editor that makes sure that everything sounds right. There's no grammatical issues. And then most importantly, a really thorough fact check. 
uh, because a lot of the times it's really easy to kind of misquote or to mess up some numbers. So before anything goes out, we do a pretty thorough fact check, which sometimes even like includes debating in the team, like, well, what does that mean? Or what does this mean? You know, we really try to make sure that the journalism that's coming out is as fair as possible. Yeah, I appreciate the fairness. I appreciate that you're going to find something that's actually impactful on people's lives and making sure that what you're delivering to them is truthful and that it's it's really not going for their emotions. It's just going for kind of logic. So I want to dive a little bit into your background and where you have that appreciation for logic and facts. So what were you doing before you started Upward News? Kind of what's your educational background and how was the transition? And I do have a, a follow-up question, but I'm not going to add it on to three questions. <laughs> yeah. So I studied computer science. And one of the reasons that I studied computer science was, first of all, because I'm a son of immigrants and I have to go to college. It's just something you have to do. And I just went to college and I looked at which one of these majors is going to help me pay off my debt that I get from going to college the fastest. And at the time, computer science was like the answer. So I decided to do computer science. Um, never really loved it. I thought it was interesting and I thought it was cool, but I wasn't like in love with it the way that you really need to be to do these kinds of things and to be passionate about it. So I went through that whole entire thing. I worked in the industry for about three years doing full stack development. And the cool thing about computer science, and I think everybody should learn how to do it, is that there's no room for opinion. You know, when you're talking to a computer, and telling it what to do, there's no opinion that you're writing in your code. It's just pure objectivity, you know, at its like lowest level. And when you kind of get used to thinking in that kind of mentality, like every single day, your job is to solve these problems with the computer and program. You don't have time to even dive into any like fallacies, any opinions, you're just thinking very logically. And so I wasn't even into politics until like 2018. And the only reason that I got into it at that point was that I was someone that was just thinking logically and all around me, I was seeing people not thinking logically, you know, a lot of wrong ways to deduce like arguments um, and a lot of people caught up in their emotions. And so here's me, this guy that really doesn't care about politics at all and had no interest ever. And then all of a sudden I hear people saying like really crazy things that make no sense. And so once I started kind of like listening in, I started realizing that it's really not too complicated to break down these stories so that people can just get the facts and hopefully be able to make a logical argument from there. And yeah, I had that opportunity, like I said, during that summer of 2020, when uh, it was a mixture of the pandemic, it was the mixture of BLM, you know, it was just the time was happening on social media, the angst was there to create something that could cause an impact. And I started doing it at that point. I wouldn't go full time doing Upward for about two years. And it was a very long journey full of a lot of pivots of figuring out how to turn this thing into like something that can stand on its own. The goal has always been how can we create a machine that delivers the truth to people without me spending 14 hours a day doing it? You know, because that won't, that won't work. And for a long time, I thought maybe I'd have a team and we would just do social media better than everybody else. Uh, that kind of turned out to not work at all around 2021 and when the pandemic got worse and all the censorship happened because the way we would, we would make money was advertising through Instagram. But when they're censoring you, you can't really provide your advertisers any kind of engagement. So uh, there's been a lot of pivots and it's been a journey of a lot of failures. Uh, but, you know, when you take a step back, you're kind of still going higher. Um, so it's great. <laughs> Do you look at your basis in computer science being that it is very logically sound as a great benefit to you to now be an editor in chief in an industry that's so emotionally driven? I think it is the fundamental thing that has kind of led all of this, really, like that objective way of thinking that I don't think I really had before I did computer science or before I studied programming. So I would give all of my credit to that. Um, I look at it like a superpower in a way. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I said everybody should be learning this. Like, there is no reason that kids in elementary school should not be taking programming classes. You know, that is much better than them seeing all uh, being taught like these political ideologies that we're seeing in classrooms across the nation. You know, it's like 
night and day. Most definitely. You had mentioned that you made the transition two years into the project. At what point did you know that you were ready to go all in full time with Upward? Was it the first dollar that you made or when you had an inkling that the growth was really going to start? How did you start the transition process there to go full full time and hop right into it? Yeah, well, the way I had been doing it at the time was I had a full time job. I was doing computer science. Uh, in my free time, usually after work, I would spend the rest of my day working on Upward. And it got to the point where I wanted to move faster. You know, like the vision that I had for Upward, it wasn't going to happen allocating this little time to it. Um, and I realized that I was in a really strong position because during the pandemic, I mean, we're all like the same age. A lot of us moved back home and weren't paying rent at the time. And so I was at home with my parents. Um, the risk was actually kind of small in terms of quitting my job because it's not like I have a massive rent that I need to pay. Um, and I tried to strike a deal with our first partners, a uh, large advertising deal to, to sell in the newsletter. That was with Public Square, by the way. Everyone should check them out. They're awesome. Um, and we got this deal going with them. And that was the perfect opportunity where I could do it full time. And since then, it's been nonstop. You know, I don't, I'd never really imagined <laughs> working this hard. Um, one of the things that I always say is that there's two different kinds of immigrants that come to America. The first is the kind that understands how much opportunity is in America just by working like a nine to five. Like it's a guaranteed win of living a very high quality life that you won't live anywhere else by doing the same kind of low risk job, essentially. And so there's immigrants that they will just do that. You know, they'll get a salary job and that is the American dream. And then there's the other kind of immigrant, which is like, this is America. Why would you do a nine to five salary job when you can be an entrepreneur and create, you know, businesses? Because you can't do that anywhere else, too. And the first kind of immigrant looks at the second kind of immigrant like they're crazy and vice versa. And my parents are very hard workers, but they've always been the first kind of immigrant. You know, they've had very stable jobs. I've been able to really come here with nothing and live the American dream. And so when they see me working so hard and compare that to the job that I had beforehand, where really it's kind of low stress and you can just cruise and have a nice work-life balance, they really think I'm crazy. So yeah, that's been fun to kind of deal with that and realize that you have to work hard. Well, you've worked very hard to, to build this brand the way it is now. And you've also learned a ton in the process. And from your perspective, how would you describe the current state of the internet if you were to give a, a pure state of the union? Uh, I know you mentioned that you're, you have a superpower in the sense that you're so objective and stick to the facts. So what is the current state of the internet? Where do you thrive? And what's next for Upward News? Great questions. I think the state of the internet was very easy to kind of talk about right before Elon Musk bought Twitter which then changed a lot of things. Because at that point, the state of the internet was, you have your major, major social media sites that everyone uses as a public square, right? You go there to talk to people. That's the only way that you're going to talk to people. Uh, one of the things I always point out on Twitter is that you can literally go on Twitter and you can respond to a politician, you know, people of the highest powers, and they will see it. They will see your response. And if you dunk on them, they will have to respond something to, to it. And they often do. And it's like, whenever in the universe has there been an opportunity, just do that. So there was this really powerful censorship apparatus that took control of all of these major social media networks. Uh, we've written about it extensively. You know, it was at the time, we all thought that it was just these social media networks that were doing this because they, they had their own, you know, political ideologies of this shouldn't be talked about. This shouldn't be talked about. And to a certain extent, that's true. But then we've also found out recently that the U.S. government was pressuring them very, very much so to get them to uh, censor a lot of these conversations. So before Elon Musk had bought Twitter, I would say it's not a, it's not a good future. You know, there's a lot of censorship. It's going to be a lot of balkanization of the Internet. So breaking up those ways that we communicate with each other into like smaller uh, ways of doing that. And, even we're seeing this with like news sites, you know, there's still a couple of behemoth news sites, but there's becoming more and more small ones that have their own readers. So we're already seeing that split. But after the purchase of Twitter by Elon Musk, you know, I think he's bringing back competition because now 
if you're a Facebook and it's election time and people want to talk about the election and you're not letting them, then of course they're going to go to Twitter, you know, where no one's stopping them. So it's the beauty of competition again. I think we're going to see um, a lot of a lot of that free speech come back. And actually, we're going to be writing about this in the next couple of days. Uh, a lot of social media sites and even YouTube are now starting to relax these censorship rules that they created over the past two years. So right now, YouTube is now letting people question the 2020 election again, which is crazy to begin with that. If you had said anything about the 2020 election, you know, just doubting any kinds of numbers, they would strike you. Uh, and so, yeah, they put out a statement a couple of days ago saying we're releasing those limitations. So we'll see. I think that the Internet is incredibly important. I think freedom of speech on the Internet, that's probably the most important thing that we have to fight for. And with the people that are coming into the, the ideologies that are happening right now on the conservative side of things with these like uh, real inclination for freedom of speech uh, compared to the other side, which has really wanted less of it. Uh, I think we're going to we're going to see that battle get a little more intensified. So obviously we've seen the marketplace of ideas have a dramatic shift with Elon Musk buying Twitter. And then in the last two weeks, we've seen a very prominent politician, Ron DeSantis, deciding to announce his running for president on and now Robert Kennedy as well. And as, as well, right. On uh, announcing that on Twitter. So how do you see the future of politics online? Because it's obviously changing and the tide's turning. It's a really great point that you bring up, and it kind of shows this genius side of Elon Musk, like another part of Elon Musk that's genius, because we already know in a lot of ways he is. And this is another one. And the way that these elections have always worked uh, is you try to make deals with the people that disseminate the information. You know, Rupert Murdoch was one of the most powerful people in America, it still is in a way, because he owns Fox News and because they can pick who their choice for president is going to be, you know. Um, and Elon Musk, knowing that Fox News has messed up recently in a couple of ways, especially with their base, is now trying to take that kingmaker position is the way that it looks like, you know, by having DeSantis on, by having RFK on. He's bringing these people to his platform. I mean, simply put, it's a great way to get more Twitter users. You know, that's going to up his numbers. That's going to help him out. But in a, a deeper perspective, it's a way for him to become the middleman in terms of using his platform to help other candidates. So I have a bit of a philosophical question for you. It can go by a lot of names, but let's let's just call it the idea of uh, decentralization. You saw it in the past, I don't know, 10 years financially with consumers looking at things like cryptocurrency, a decentralized currency. I work in the en energy industry and you're seeing uh, commercial and industrial customers or manufacturing plants, hospitals, data centers. They're literally manufacturing their own power on site. They call it distributed energy. You're seeing legacy media, which used to be a monopoly for getting news, kind of be disseminated into the idea of essentially decentralized news. So what do you think is driving the public, consumers, companies to this idea of decentralization? And what do you think the future of it looks like? It's a great question. Uh, first of all, in terms of like why people want to get out of the system or why people want to decentralize, uh, it's really because we've been centralized under institutions that over the past 20 years have repeatedly lied to the people. You know, like if we look at the American, the federal government as the centralizing power, uh, and then we look at all the federal institutions underneath it that have repeatedly, you know, not worked in the interest of the people, you'd have to be, you'd have to be crazy to not be shocked by the results here, especially after the pandemic. I mean, the trust in the institutions have never been lower. And that goes even outside the federal government. That's also the media. Uh, it's also even on a state level at this point. So, I mean, to the most extreme decentralization, I mean, that could mean pure individualism. You know, everyone has their own sustainable farm and never talks to their neighbors and stuff like that. I don't think we'll ever get to that point. I think centralization uh, to, a, to a certain degree is really important. I mean, nationalism, uh, pride in America, that's a form of centralization. That's everybody in America can come together uh, and be proud of this country. You know, that's something that's held this country 
together since its inception. And I still think that's really important. So the big challenge of the next decade is going to be rebuilding these institutions and rebuilding them with trust uh, and bringing it back to the level of trust that it was before. So people can operate normally without feeling the need to run away because a society that doesn't communicate, a society that's purely individual is kind of scary too. Uh, Same with a society that's purely collective, right? It's that whole entire balance of how much collectivism is good, how much individualism is good. To piggyback off you mentioned off what you mentioned about our institutions having degraded really over the last twenty years in a number of ways, if you consider the media, for example, um, obviously that can flip left or right. But during each presidential campaign, it's been the media that's been the car that drives the politician to the finish line. And so it seems like over time there's been this continued loyalty between the media and that specific president, regardless of what. A party they originate from. And I believe that's created an incentive for them to start to become a mouthpiece for that set of that administration. And you see that over the course of, let's say, the last two presidencies, where the information that comes from both sides of the aisle is so vastly different. And so I really like that approach of a decentralized nature to news, because what's important for media to do, and the only real role of media is to serve as a body that's able to critique the political bureau of the of the country, so to say. And for the decentralization to come to media, that's when the truth can really bubble out because there is no motivation or loyalty towards any specific political group there. It's just a loyalty to the truth. That's a great way to look at it. Again, the thought of having thousands and thousands of little news sites, each with their own you know, agenda. And we talk about objectivity a lot in this podcast so far, so far but the reality is everything is going to be biased always. You just have to strive your best to be objective. That w- would mean that, you know, every single tiny outlet has their own agenda too, you know, regardless of what it is, regardless of how much they're trying to stay bias free. Um, that'll be better than having a few massive news outlets, each as polarizing as Fox News and CNN. Uh, but You know, it's also interesting to see this whole competition thing playing out in the media world, because over the past couple of months, the New York Times, uh, they've had a couple of problems, you know, where they were posting things about the transgender movement. And a lot of these employees, they were posting facts about the transgender movement. And a lot of employees underneath uh, were really upset about it. And they did boycotts and uh, it was a whole mess there. But they've evolved in the past like three years to where they're starting to talk about like these facts that people on smaller news outlets have been talking about for a long time. And the reason they're probably doing that is because they're losing people. You know, if I have news that you don't have, people are going to read me, right? Uh, The New York Times and the CNN and all of these liberal institutions had that problem because people were going to smaller sites to get the truth when these people were just operating on ideology and not showing you it. So I think, again, maybe we'll see this kind of balancing act where the creation of these smaller news outlets purely going after the truth will incentivize these larger institutions to start picking it up again. As we switch gears more towards, once again, your business, how are you guys making money? How are you guys advertising? How are you guys growing? So we've got two ways of making money right now. We've got two different streams of revenue. The first and my favorite is our paid subscriptions. And what we're trying to do there is we're trying to give our readers content that's behind the paywall, content that is interesting, but not super necessary for the daily email. So if you like our news, if you like the way we report and you want to be very in the loop and you want to see some really interesting things too, then you'll become a paid subscriber. The difficulty with this is that we're so used to living in a world where information is free, you know, with CNN and and. Uh, the New York Times and all of these things. We always think that that's free, but I mean, it's quite obvious now that it's not. Your attention is the money and they just have their own advertisers, which has the problem of uh, making the news corrupt. For example, look at the amount of times that Pfizer has paid for advertisements on those outlets, right? So we have the problem of letting our readers know that really good news that you can trust, uh, written by people that you can trust, is worth paying for because it's quite, first of all, it's not too expensive and it's a service that's really important. 
So that's been a challenge. And I think a lot of people in the space have that challenge right now, like the daily wire, although they're killing it. The second way that we're making money is with advertising. And like I just said, advertising comes with its own cost. Ideally, if we didn't need advertisers, we wouldn't do it. Um, there's just no way around it at this point. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find uh, advertisers that we know our audience would be interested in. And we're trying to find advertisers that really don't conflict with what we're reporting. For example, if the Trump uh, campaign wants to start doing ads, uh, we're probably not going to take them, right? Uh, but if someone is selling American-made skincare, for example, then that's something like we're not going to start writing uh, or it's not going to make people think that our, our news is less accurate all of a sudden. So that's the difference between CNN covering the pandemic and talking about everyone getting their boosters followed by an ad by Pfizer who creates the boosters. Now, a number of our listeners would have large Instagram accounts or maybe they're influencers or they're running some type of other motivated uh, social media account for the sake of growth. How are you bringing in revenue in terms of these advertisers? How do you meet them? How do you show them your value proposition? The sales process is really tough. It's been one of the biggest challenges. Uh, the first is finding these leads, finding people that you think are going to be advertisers you should work with. The second challenge is getting actually in touch with them. There's a bunch of different ways people do that. And some people go through LinkedIn, uh, pay for the sales package on there. Some people do cold emails. However, you could get that information. You got to claw it. You got to figure out how to get in touch with them. Um, and I think that last question is asking, how do you really seal the deal there and show them what you have? And really, if it's a good fit, I don't think you'll have too much of a challenge there. If, if it's truly a good match and this works and it's a win-win situation for both parties, you're not going to have to convince them. It's something that they want for themselves too. Um, we haven't really had that, that kind of moment where we're trying to convince some, some partner to do an advertising deal with us that they don't want. It just hasn't happened. And that's because we've worked with companies that we're aligned with. Uh, when you start working with companies that maybe it's more of a win for you than it is for them, that's when you start running into the problem. And uh, yeah, it should be a, a clear focus the whole time that your customers at that point are your partners. And so some people call them clients, right? But when an advertiser is buying advertising from us, they become our customer. And I have to start making sure that they're getting what they paid for, that we're working really well for them. Um, and it's the same way that I look at our readers too. You know, I'm serving two two different people with this, um, which makes it tough, which all goes back to why I would just like the business to be paid subscriptions. And uh, we're going to see if we can make that happen. It's going to be tough, but uh, it, it's something definitely worth doing. So you have two strong uh, streams of revenue and you mentioning being that second type of immigrant. And I have no doubt that you want to take this company upward pun completely intended. Uh, <laughs> what is your long-term vision for Upward News? I said something earlier in the podcast about having this machine that just serves people and delivers the truth and can function almost autonomously without me and can grow from there. So that's not first and foremost is creating something that can stand on its own legs. Because if I go on a vacation for one week, this whole show is stopping. Um, and a lot of small news outlets are like this. You know, a lot of creators are like this. That's the flaw with the whole creator model is that if you have a problem where you are the whole entire business. So first and foremost, it's getting out of there and uh, really building out a team that can help support this. And we're getting really close. You know, I think my key role is still curation and figuring out the stories as the editor in chief. But besides that, we've kind of got it down to like a, to to a science. So we're making that work. In terms of the long-term vision, it's getting this to as many people as possible. And it's creating a news outlet that people can trust again. And people call the New York Times the paper of record because it's so big. So many people read it. Uh, liberals read it. Conservatives read it. And most of the times they trust it. Um, but the thing is, you'll still never see a lot of these conservative ideas on there until they're not even conservative anymore, right? Like for the past three years, you will see these conservative websites pushing these stories and getting things out into the public. And only after doing that for three years will the New York Times write about it. It's kind of crazy. Uh, and so the goal with Upward News is to really be ahead of the curve and create 
this kind of news that is the paper of record in some way for this group of people that just wants the truth. I love it. You came from being a computer science major. You ended up being a, a st full stack developer. Now you have this project that you love and you want to take it to you know such a high level with such a meaningful mission. What what advice would you give to a, a computer science major that might not be sold on it like you were back uh, back in your college days to you know really explore something new or how to navigate the world with the skill set that he gained in college? He yeah. or she. <laughs> the first thing is computer science is like a fantastic career, especially if you want to live a normal life. The salaries are great. The work-life balance is great. You really have to be kind of crazy to give that up. Um, and in a scenario where you are crazy enough to give it up because you realize that's not the only thing you want to be doing, you got to figure out what to do. It's a really useful skill to have right now because you can get into so many different businesses with it. Um, I, I created the Upward website with my skills. Uh, that I had from there. Um, it wasn't totally necessary, but you know, I still did it. It's just really finding something that's more passionate. At the end of the day, if you're more passionate about something than you are your main job, it's worth seeing if you can do the other one more than you're doing what you're currently doing as a salary. Uh, when it comes to like being brave and taking that leap, you can't, you can't really convince someone of that. They have to know that they can do it. They have to convince themselves. Most definitely. So I first want to say I've really enjoyed this conversation. We've brought together philosophy, real world advice, a little bit of business, a little bit of everything. So as we wind down the episode, can you describe to us your no fear moment, that point where regardless of the adversity that you were faced, you fought through it and you persevered? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me. This has been an awesome, awesome conversation. A lot of great questions. A lot of people always talk about that moment of quitting their full-time job where they have to muster up enough courage. They have to talk to themselves for hours and hours and really convince them that they can do this thing. That was a crazy moment, right? Doing that. But it was a great moment because at that point, you know, you're like a child again. The whole future and all of your potential is ahead of you. Uh, and that's a great place to be at is where everything within you is just potential because it's perfect. You know, it's just look what you can be. Um, and it's great. You can drink a bottle of champagne and you can celebrate that you just quit your job before you start building this business. But I think the real no fear moment is when you're failing continuously and you're trying to set up these uh, goals for yourself and you're falling short. And that is a thousand times harder than quitting your job because you have to say, I'm sticking with this and I'm going to do it. So my no fear moment comes to me every couple of weeks <laughs> when I'm looking at how Upward is doing and I'm like, I wish we were doing better than we were doing right now, but you know what? I'm serving a bigger purpose here and I'm going to keep pushing through it. So that's all I got to say on that front. The upward and downward of entrepreneurship. <laughs> Ari, where can our viewers find you? Absolutely. Well, we've got the best political newsletter in the game right now. We read every single newsletter that's out there and we make sure that ours is better than theirs every single day. Uh, you can go to www.upward.news and put in your email. And then the following day, you will get the best analysis and insights on the political world with things that you will never see in the mainstream media. So that is the best way to get in touch. Uh, for people that want to get in touch with me directly, just respond to any of the emails you get from Upward News. They all go to me. I read each one of them. Uh, and I love having conversations with readers. Upward News, give them a shot. Hey, Ari, thanks for hopping on today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It's been amazing. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the No Fear podcast, brought to you by House and Hughes. For more information about our show, visit the nofearpodcast.com. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok for insights into future episodes.